Hello everyone. Welcome to this artist talk. Bienvenue à la présentation d'artistes. Aujourd'hui, Amaranth Borsig, professor, author, artist, and poet, is with us from her home in Washington State. Um, and Nathan Brown is also home, but here in town. Um, I'm at the Antism Project Space in Jojage, or Montreal. And welcome to the third edition of the Volume Art Book Fair. And thanks for joining us. Merci d'être ici aujourd'hui avec nous, de prendre le temps de participer à la Four Volume. Uh, before we start, a few things you need to know. Um, my name is Maya. I'm programming coordinator of the fair. I go by she, her pronouns. And um, the meeting will be recorded. We'll be posting it on um, the, the Volume Fair's YouTube and hosting it also on the fair's website for the month of October. That'll be uh, translated with some subtitles before we post it. So it should be shortly in the next few days. Um, and at the Nathan, I will be taking questions at the end. If you do have any, you can type them in at any time. Uh, ça peut être en français aussi, puis je peux les traduire par la suite. And um, then if you prefer um, voicing them at the end, you can use the raising hand function. And that way we can unmute you so that you can um, do it out loud and then they'll be able to answer right away. Um, yeah, that's it for housekeeping. <laughs> I... We'll give you an introduction of our two speakers. Amaranth Borsik's work focuses on textual materiality from the surface of the page to the surface of language. Her most recent publication is the book published at MIT Press in 2018. It's a brief introduction to the book as an object, content, idea, and interface. It's published in the MIT Press Essential Knowledge series. Borsak is currently an, an, an associate professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington, Basel, where she also serves as associate director of the MFA in Creative Writing and Poetics. She has a PhD in Literature and Creative Writing from the University of Southern California, where her work focused on the use of writing technologies by modern and contemporary poets to change their relationship to the page and their construction of authorship. And Nathan Brown received, uh, is Associate Professor of English at Concordia University and also Canada Research Chair in Poetics, through which he founded the Center for Expanded Poetics at Concordia in 2015. Professor Brown's research moves between critical theory, poetics, and science and technology studies, investigating conceptual and material determinations of structure and form. With Michael Nardone, Professor Brown edits the publishing imprint of the Center for Expanded Poetics, which is called Documents. Accompanying the talk is also an exhibition of Amaranth's work presented at the Antism Project Space. Um, it'll be running when we can <laughs> have people over. And so it'll be running for the foreseeable future, depending on what happens with Montreal's COVID regulations. And uh, Amaranth and Nathan are in conversation on the topic of Amaranth's most recent publication, the book. Uh, and that'll be in relation to her artistic process and practice that is on show here. Voila, it's my beginning. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. Um, I will eclipse myself and uh, come back at the end for a question period. Okay, thanks so much, Maya. Uh, Thank you so too. <laughs> I'll just briefly say that um, Amrit is going to speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then I'll moderate a discussion and, and have some questions for Amaranth as well. Uh, so Amaranth, I'm looking forward to your talk very much. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. I'm going to share a presentation with you now. So um, for first, I, I uh, would like to say thank you um, to Maya for inviting me to be part of this year's volume fair, to Nathan, who is an admired friend and colleague for taking part in the conversation, to Antiism for hosting the exhibition and to all of you in attendance today. Um, is the, uh, does the presentation look all right, Nathan? Great, glad to hear it. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a poet, scholar and book artist whose practice encompasses print and digital media, performance and installation. The work that I make takes the form that it requires and it varies from project to project. This is partly because my creative practice is research-based. I'm interested in art as exploration, and I engage in projects where I begin with an idea, but where the work itself teaches me during the creative process. My most recent publication is a critical volume on the book, and I approach the subject through the lens of a hybrid poet seeking to understand what a book is, can be, 
and can do and how our feelings about that have changed over time. In my talk today, I'm gonna to be using the word book a lot and what that word means to you might vary from person to person. I would imagine that in a gathering like this one of those interested in artist books and publication, your own definitions will be rich and varied. But as a starting point, I think we should acknowledge the object that most of us will be picturing in our mind's eye when we hear that word. A stack of pages printed on both sides, bound on one end and encased between covers. It might look something like this illustration of a hardbound book. Known to historians and bookbinders as a codex, this object got its name for the Lat from the Latin word for tree trunk, which was the term Romans used for its precursor object a gathering of wooden tablets that were hollowed out and filled with wax that could be inscribed with a pointed stylus. The uh, object in this illustration is so ubiquitous, it's been naturalized to us for such a degree that we don't even notice its form anymore. In fact, for some readers, this shape is so essential to our idea of what a book is and how it functions. The notion that digital reading devices like the Kindle or iPad might replace it is horrifying. But while the codex has enjoyed a long history, it is not the only form in which language has been recorded. In fact, <clears throat> it's preceded by more than 2000 years of different forms each culture has found for recording information. These are just a few of the many physical forms uh, that we've resorted to over time from the uh, Mesopotamian clay tablet uh, depicted here to the Chinese bamboo scroll uh, in the upper right corner of your screen or um, the Chinese uh, accordion bound book in the lower left corner, a really broad range of different shapes. And in every case that the book appears over recorded history, it changes shape with the materials that are available, the needs of writers and readers, and the political and social climate in which it arises. So my own definition of the book is capacious enough to include all of these other forms because I think that they teach us something essential about what a book is and does. So here's my definition that I'll be using for the purposes of this talk. The book is a portable information storage and retrieval device, a material form for the dissemination of text. I don't say this is the only definition or even the right one, but it's one that's been useful to me in thinking about my own creative practice and in thinking about where books have come from and where they're headed. In my own practice, when I make, oh, I'm sorry, uh, let me show you a, a, a slide that sort of gives you maybe a little background on how I'm thinking about this. Um, one of the things that my research into the book has shown me is that in all books, whether a rare bound volume or an ebook on a Kindle, the interface through which we read is a kind of body, and that body interacts with the reader's body. And we can't pretend that a book is simply content that can be poured into any form the physical form fundamentally impacts the work's meaning as expressed in this quote from uh, Kate Hale's book, Writing Machines, where she says, literature was never only words, never merely immaterial verbal constructions. Literary texts like us have bodies an actuality necessitating that their materialities and meanings are deeply interwoven into each other. And that, you know, that goes for a, a, a rare book as well as a, you know, a printed paperback that you have on your shelf. Um, the uh, image you see in the background of this slide is for me an exciting historical example of a work uh, that's material form and meaning are deeply interwoven. It's the Chansonnier de Jean de Montcheneux from 1470. This is a facsimile edition from 2007. Um, and it is a codex of French and Italian love songs commissioned by a nobleman and bishop. Um, the form and the content here are clearly closely related. The book has been bound in a rich red velvet. It's being held open for you right now, but if you can imagine it closed, you would see a single heart. And once it's open, the reader is holding two hearts in their hands, which is emblematic of the two hearts that are united when, you know, in the act of love. Love is the representation of the joining of two, two together. Uh, in addition, you can see the text has been hand illuminated directly to the shape of the page. So it's the interior content has been designed for the physical format of the heart shape. And another fun thing about this uh, historical book is that anytime the word heart appears within the work, it's been replaced with a drawing of a heart, which is a kind of like proto emoji. I'm particularly interested in experiments like this one with form and content intertwined. 
And in my own work, I look for ways to explore this intersection, particularly as it relates to the relationship between print and digital media. For this reason, I'm drawn to artists' books because of their very engagement with this relationship between form and content, as in the book by Alison Knowles from 1967 that you can see in the background of this slide, which readers had to navigate by climbing, crawling, and moving through its pages. The reader, in this case, becomes the text because the book's meaning arises from our traversal of it. And in the foreground, you have a quote from Johanna Drucker. Her uh, definition of the artist book is one that has been useful to me um, because she really explains that if an artist is going to make a book, there has to be some rationale for doing so. It has to have some conviction, some soul, some reason to be and to be a book in order to succeed because otherwise an artist would make a sculpture or an installation or a painting. Uh, if you're going to choose to work in book form as Knowles does here, you have to be in some way interrogating what a book is. And this book called The Big Book, uh, which is composed of eight foot tall, uh, of eight eight foot tall leaves bound along a central hinge, was constructed on the first floor of the brownstone that she shared with Dick Higgins in New York. Um, it features a number of images from Moybridge's motion studies. You can see one uh, towards the center top of the frame, right around where the apostrophe is after artists. Um, which already clues you in as a reader to the fact that the body in motion is central to the meaning of this work. And as you traverse from page opening to page opening, uh, as a reader, you're going through a series of rooms. The book had a library, a gallery, a kitchen, and even a toilet. And one thing that this project does is by making the book no longer portable, but exploding it, Knowles makes us see the book's body in relation to our own. This isn't a book that you can sit still and scan with your eyes. Reading in this case becomes a bodily act. And as I was saying, the, the reader becomes the text because no two, reader is going, is, no two readers will have the same experience of this book. Um, what, what you are feeling that day, your own mobility and abilities, your own interests are all going to affect whether you climb that ladder, whether you crawl through the tunnel, uh, whether you lay down in the astroturf or sit on that toilet. We all have to move through this book serially, one opening at a time, which is different from the codex that might sit on our desks that we have random access to and can flip back and forth between the front and back. That becomes much harder in this format. In my own practice, when I make a book, I try to consider what Drucker and Hales are talking about, the ways that the form and content can be in dialogue. And I try to see what that conversation can teach me. In 2012, Brad Baus and I collaborated on Between Page and Screen. This is a book of poems that contains no text, only black and white geometric shapes and instructions to find the words visit between page and screen.com. At the website, if the reader follows the instructions to show the book to their webcam, that's when the poems appear, a series of love letters between two characters, P and S, pushing at the boundaries of their relationship. The poems explore the etymologies of the words page and screen and use them to try to understand how we might envision a place for both modalities rather than having to choose between them. Risking its own technological obsolescence, the book uses marker-based augmented reality to create the illusion of a digital pop-up book. The words do not exist on either page or screen, but in the space between them opened up by the reader and facilitated by computer. The poems can't exist without both interfaces, the print and the digital. Between page and screen taught me something that I really should have known, that every book is shaped by its reader. What they're wearing, where they're sitting, how they're feeling, and how their body moves through space, all of that is part of the book. Because we turned on the camera, suddenly you actually have to see it and confront it. Every reader is a witness to their own act of reading. This is true, of course, not only for digital books, but for print as well. And it's one of many features that print and digital books have in common. Book artist and publisher Dick Higgins foregrounds the importance of readers in his definition of artist books. He says, it might be any art. An artist's book could be music, photography, graphics, intermedial literature, the experience of reading it, viewing it, framing it, that is what the artist stresses in making it. Um, so he reminds us that book artists aren't thinking like writers. The emphasis isn't the text, it's the body. 
specifically the meeting of the body of the book and the reader. Uh, the image you see in the background here is from a book called Sweethearts by Emmett Williams that Higgins published under his imprint Something Else Press in 1967. Um, the uh, book uh, has a, an unusual sort of visual and textual quality. Uh, it is a book of poetry where every poem is made of anagrams in order of uh, letters that appear in the title, Sweethearts, uh, which you can see here in the background. It says the sweethearts seed as the sea seeds. Um, it's from a scene in which the two characters in this book, he and she, uh, visit the seashore and have a romantic dalliance there. So every poem in this book is 11 characters wide and 11 deep, maximum, really using the grid of the page and exploiting it. One of the fun things that um, uh, Sweethearts is able to do is by playing with the grid and, and playing with uh, the actual limitations of the number of letters in these anagrams, Williams manages to create these uh, animations, essentially. So this is um, a digital facsimile by Mindy Sue that emulates what it's like to flip through the book. Not only is it legible page by page as a series of poems that tell a narrative, it's also a kind of proto animation or a flip book. Um, and as you are flipping through it, you are seeing the words dance across the page, which is something Williams was interested in playing with. I've continued to explore the intersection between print and digital reading in a number of projects. This one, Whispering Galleries, was created as a site-specific text work for the New Haven Public Libraries in Connecticut. It uses the metaphor of the architectural whispering gallery, which allows people on opposite sides of a room to whisper to one another and hear each other's voices clearly, thanks to the domed roof above them. But the dome in this case is an infrared dome projected above the leap motion controller, which you see on the pedestals at right. When visitors moved their hand through this dome, their gestures would sweep the dust from a text on screen, revealing poems hidden within it, depicted on the left. The text came from the diary of an anonymous shopkeeper who lived and worked in the area in 1858. His daily life was measured out by hand, at work and at rest. He writes in the diary about uh, both uh, doing the physical labor of making trade and upkeeping the property, and then also playing the violin and writing music in the evening. Um, the poems bring his hand out as a character, inviting readers to see their own hands in a lineage with this unknown ancestor. This project, Abra, a collaboration with Kate Durbin and Ian Hatcher, also explores the role of the hand in the reading interface. We received a grant from the Center for Book and Paper Arts to create what they called an expanded artist book that incorporated both a limited edition book and a free iPad and iPhone app based on our project Abra, a book of mutating poems. Our goal with the artist book was to make the page and the iPad into a continuous touch screen interface, reminding readers of the book's body and their own. We used blind letterpress impression, heat sensitive disappearing ink, and laser cut openings to invite the reader to caress the surface of the page. And as they page through the book, they begin to see the text changing and mutating on its own. It is a, a long poem that is actually about mutation and that enacts a kind of mutation page by page. And um, they begin as they page through the book to glimpse inserted into the back of the book an iPad that contains the same text, but which is already in the process of changing, which they can see through openings um, made by you know, these laser cut shapes that gradually cohere into an aperture at the center of the book. In the app, the text invites further interaction of the reader's hand. Words change when you touch them. You can add new text, erase, prune, and otherwise alter the text to make it your own. We wanted to celebrate the fact that all texts belong to the reader by making that mutability palpable. And the process of creating the artist book in the app was really a dialogic one where we, we knew essentially what the starting point for this text was. It was a text co-authored by Kate and I, but we wanted that text to immediately surpass or exceed or move beyond any individual notion of authorship. And, and begin to create its own life form. Um, so 
the ability to collaborate with Ian Hatcher really allowed the text to come to life in a new way in the app where it is truly beyond the control of the author and it belongs to the reader. And this animation, uh, just as to give you a sense of what it's like to page through the book, you can see that the um, apertures made by the laser cutter move from the margins and into the center. What I love about working in books and the reason I think artist books are such an important object of study for anyone who wants to understand what a book is and what it can do is that because they always in some way interrogate their material form, they make embodiment <clears throat> central to the reading experience, reminding us of the body of the book and of the reader and the performative moment where the two meet. They remind us that a book is and has always been an interactive medium. Um, I think this uh, quotation from Craig Dworkin's book, No Medium, is a nice way of reminding ourselves that a, a, a book is not simply an object, it is something that gets activated by the moment of access. He writes, as much acts of interpretation as material things, as much processes as objects, media are not merely storage mechanisms somehow independent of the acts of reading they record. So a book doesn't simply store information. It's the act of reading that actually is where the, the book appears. And the image you see in the background here is from a, a novella written for iPad by Tender Claws called Pry that really takes advantage of what the iPad interface allows in terms of touch interactivity to layer the reader's desire to pry and open up the text onto the um, main character of the novella's own desire to pry into and understand his repressed uh, traumatic war history. For the rest of my talk, I wanna share with you a few of the features that physical books have in common with digital ones, using artist books as my primary examples. I'm sure many of you know um, uh, Ulysses Carrion and his very well uh, known and well regarded manifesto, The New Art of Making Books, which is where this quotation is from. What I love about Carrion's definition of the book in this very first sentence as a sequence of spaces is that it establishes the possibility of books to create virtual reality. And he writes, each of these spaces is perceived at a different moment. A book is also a sequence of moments. A book is not a case of words, nor a bag of words, nor a bearer of words. Um, obviously, this is a hyperbolic manifesto. He published it in Octavio Paz's literary journal, Plural, and he was really aiming at an audience of other writers um, for whom he wanted to shake up the hierarchical relationship that they had established between writer and reader and writer and bookmaker. Um, Carrion, of course, you know, was a writer himself, a very successful fiction writer in Mexico City. He won prizes for his short stories and published two collections. Um, but in the manifesto, he writes that books are boring because all the pages are the same. And uh, what he wanted writers to do was to take a more active role in conceptualizing their books. Uh, that virtual reality capacity of the book for me is really nicely manifest in the tunnel book form. Um, the tunnel book is a contemporary form that continues to be used that likely has its historical origins in something like this uh, book depicted in the slide, The Tunnel Under the Thames, um, which was a kind of um, souvenir created for the digging of the tunnel under the Thames in London in 1826. And it's a series of uh, two-dimensional scenes that have been layered and a cutout in the front cover that allows you to look through uh, and see those layers one behind the other. I'll uh, play this clip, which will hopefully give you a sense of what that experience of looking through it is like. Um, this is known as the tunnel binding because of this example, but it probably actually originates uh, in the Italian Renaissance in peep shows that were created as kind of perspective boxes with scenes inside them that would be viewed um, from a particular single point opening that would allow you to kind of have that depth experience. And those developed into traveling shows with scenes from the Bible, history, and mythology. Essentially, uh, the tunnel book is a stage set with a performance for an audience of one, much like a virtual reality headset. Um, another 
uh, way in which the physical book has the capacity to do many of things that digital books have is to think about the cinematic possibilities of, of the book form, which are exploited here by Canadian filmmaker Michael Snow in his book Cover to Cover from 1975. And in this work, Snow is really playing with the sequentiality of the book form and the possibility for every opening to create a two page spread in which the eye has to move across both while also viewing them simultaneously. So he's playing with left to right uh, movement as well as the kind of top down overview that we get when looking at a two page spread. He does this by photographing the same event from two different angles, um, by photographing two dimensional objects like a piece of paper that's being run through a typewriter or a record being placed on a phonograph uh, and then messing with our sense of whether we're looking at something flat or deep. And he does that with these pages that you see periodically where you can actually see a hand holding the surface of the page. Those are, those are hands that are in the photographs themselves. So he wants us to think about the cinematic possibilities of the book as a movie. We also tend to think about digital books as the only place where you can have a kind of interactive and um, recombinant experience with a text. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, interactivity as a fundamentally digital thing, but of course, books also have the capacity to be nonlinear and remixable. We have two examples here, one historic and one slightly more contemporary. The first, all the way on the left, is Reggio Montanus's Calendrium, which is a very early printed book from 1476. Um, and it includes these movable parts called volvels, which were an early recombinant tool for calculation and navigation. So when the book was printed, um, in the back there was a section with these printed circles that the binder would then cut out and mount along a string so that they, each dial that you see in that image could be turned individually. Here it's being used for astrological charts. On the right, you see a different example. This is Raymond Queneau's Cent Mille Milliards de Poèmes, which is 10 Petrarchan sonnets with the same meter and rhyme scheme that have been bound along one edge and then sliced so that the book can be turned one line of the poems at a time. So with that structure of 10 sonnets that are each 14 lines long, you can create 10 to the 14th power different poems. And uh, Cano estimated that it would take more than 200 million years to read them all, which of course to him as a member of the Ulipo, um, the Ouvoir de Littérature Potentielle, was uh, exactly what he wanted. He didn't think you had to read all these poems. He was interested in the potential of the book to contain them all. So when we talk about the Kindle as a kind of portable library containing thousands of volumes, um, we can compare that to a very physical material form like this one, in which uh, the number of poems contained within this text is a number that I'm always hesitant to read aloud because I, I can never remember how to express the number of zeros. <laughs> um, but the point again is not to read them, just to know that they're possible. Another thing that gets talked about frequently when we look at digital works is their ephemerality. So when you uh, purchase an ebook, say from um, Amazon, you don't actually own that book in the way that you own the physical object of a book that you buy. You own a license that allows you access to the contents of that work on specific devices and for a limited amount of time. And any digital work obviously is subject to changes in uh, device technology, updates to operating systems, all of which can break and make inaccessible works of literature. So in the instance of, in, you know, take for example, my own body of work, Between Page and Screen was written in Flash, um, which is uh, being sunset this year. So once uh, Flash ceases to be supported by Adobe, it's quite possible that the project itself will become inaccessible unless we recode it to be accessible um, through JavaScript, say. Um, likewise with our Project Abra that was written for iOS, that's a really specific programming ecosystem. And every time Apple upgrades uh, its software, the app itself has to be upgraded in the App Store. So any writer who chooses to work with those digital formats is uh, at the mercy, essentially, of the corporations that uh, developed and run those technologies. Um, but of course, 
because the book has a body like ours, it's also ephemeral. It's subject to decay and destruction, whether by moisture, fire, or insects. And they're also subject to censorship and destruction, one of the reasons that books are so often the first target during regime change, the desire to overthrow not only a, a particular group of people, but their very culture as represented in the documents that they keep. The image in the background here is an artist book that for me really typifies the ephemerality of the book and plays with it in a way that I find really intriguing. So this is Diderot's Literaturwurst, one example from a series, this one from 1969. Um, Roth basically for this project would pulp books and magazines that he disliked and then cook them using his mother's sausage recipes, German sausage recipes. Uh, to uh, cure for posterity, Marx, Hegel, and in this case, the German tabloid Quick. Um, encasing these books, to me, is a kind of punning reference to the fact that uh, the hardbound book appears in a case binding, uh, as well as the book cases of our shelves on which we preserve the, the books that we want to hold on to for posterity. And I think this is also a commentary on the consumption of books. Um, this is a book whose consumption, as well as whose preservation, renders it inaccessible, that turning the, the book into this um, preserved sausage uh, uh, sort of uh, removes our ability to ever read its contents. And maybe on another level, I think that um, Roth is having some fun with the curators and conservators who would want to purchase and acquire these works and many museums have um, because the shelf life of a dried sausage is about six weeks unless you refrigerate it. So uh, if you wanna prevent this work from decaying and from potentially jeopardizing anything that's held in your collections neighboring to this object, um, you have to think pretty carefully about what preservation means to you. Of course, um, ephemerality was a huge part of Roth's practice and he worked with a lot of ephemeral materials, including chocolate, and birdseed and bodily fluids. So at the start of this talk, I define the book as a portable information storage and retrieval device. And I mentioned that I don't think that this is uh, the only or even the best definition. In fact, I think that the book is an idea we agree on culturally and one that shifts with our needs and capacities. Its definition comes in part through dialogue, experimentation, and creative reinterpretation through the work of book artists um, and others uh, probably in this audience who are, are really helping to define what books are. So when my book, The Book, was about to come out, I reached out to more than 100 writers, artists, publishers, scholars, and librarians to ask how they defined the book. And I published their definitions at this website to create a living catalog of the book's porous boundaries. I'll share a few that though they differ in some significant ways, cohere around the embodied performative and interactive capacities of the book. And I would really like for their words to be the last word here. Jason Dodge writes, I think a book is where we explore the magical space between eyes and a bent arm. And Hamilton writes, a book is where the far away meets the near at hand, the tea cooling on the table, the hard seat of the chair, the horn sounding outside the window. Indira Allegra says, the book is a time travel device, allowing us to slip into the imagination of a future mind. And Travis Schaffer says, the book is a dislocation device. Sarah Bodman writes, a book is a magic portal. And I, I think as all of their quotations remind us, the book is changing, but it always has been and I hope that all of you will come up with your own definitions. Thanks for your time. Um, well, thanks so much, Amaranth. That was, uh, <laughs> that was really wonderful um, and extremely informative. Um, and thanks. I've really enjoyed uh, reading your MIT book on, on the book and, and definitely learned a great deal from it. Before we get started in conversation, I wonder if any of the participants, uh, any of the attendees, uh, have any questions that they'd like to pose to Amaranth or any topics that they'd like to hear more about. I guess you can enter questions in the Q&A panel or perhaps in the, in the chat bar. Um, or I think you can um, 
unmute your, your own panel and pose them orally if you'd like to. Okay, well, Amrith, maybe you and I can get started. And if people do have questions as we go, please feel free to, uh, to include them. Um, you can write them in and, uh, and we can take them up if, if they come to mind as we, as we talk. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is just give you an opportunity to bring us up to speed with your own work. Um, the exhibition at the Anti-Ism Project space uh, is really lovely. I was able to go there on Wednesday and take a look. I certainly encourage anyone who's in Montreal, um, if and when the, the quarantine ends, uh, to, go, to go take a look at the work that's there. Um, it looks fantastic in the space. But I'm also wondering about your, your research at present as a scholar. So I was wondering if, if you might be able to talk a bit about research projects that you're engaged in right now, and maybe how uh, the work that you've done on the book um, enters into and continues in, in some of the thinking that you're doing at the moment. Yeah, well, the, um, one of the areas of focus of this talk is the relationship between the book and the body. And that's been something that's been of great interest to me since finishing the book, is spending more time exploring both the historic and contemporary relationship between books and bodies since uh, essentially the book develops as this portable form that's really sized to the needs of, of the humans who would be carrying and using it. So if you um, were a priest needing a, a book for your you know, sort of performative services, your early illuminated manuscripts would be these very large uh, books that were meant to be objects of display um, versus if you were an early reader um, you you wanted something that was small and portable that could uh, that could come with you so that you could sort of practice your prayers over the course of the day, and in addition, the the book itself, the earliest um, uh, codex books that we have are deeply connected with animal bodies, which provided both the interior parchment pages and then the exterior covers too. Um, so the the body is so much a part of the book's history. Um, and so much a part of how we understand the function of the book that I've been uh, interested in the ways that book artists have investigated that relationship, um, particularly in a moment where, as I've mentioned, we're consistently concerned about the potential death of the book. And we talk about death, which is, of course, a very human concern, right? Uh, concern about our own mortality, which gets kind of uh, projected onto the book object. Um, so I've been looking at um, artist books that interrogate the shape of the book and directly put it in conversation with the human body by using materials like hair and skin or other bodily materials um, as part of its construction, or that build artist books as memorials um, and exploring uh, those works in relationship to questions of books and bodies. Um, so that's a, a recent research project that's um, kind of a long-term project underway. Um, and then in uh, the, the exhibition at um, Antiism that you mentioned, that exhibition uh, includes all collaborative works that I've done with other people um, who are interested in similar questions to mine around reading and interactivity. Um, so all of, the, all of the works were made with other people. Um, there's one that uh, was perhaps made alone, but is using um, code that was written by Nick Monfort that's a re-implementation of an artist's book that Allison Knowles and James Tenney wrote um, that is a, a generator that generates imaginary books. Um, so I think collaboration, <clears throat> I mentioned collaboration as a way that I think we understand books. For me, it's also a way of exploring um, books in my creative practice and collaboration continues to be an important investment for me. I'm currently collaborating with an artist here in Seattle, Carrie Bodel, on a project exploring um, the National Archives here, which uh, last January, it was announced, would be relocated probably to um, Southern California and somewhere in the Midwest, because the property on which those archives sit is more valuable to NARA, a government entity, as real estate 
and that it will be sold to the highest bidder in order to build housing and condos in a, in a kind of ritzy part of Seattle. Um, so there was a lot of uproar about that because the public wasn't consulted in that decision. Um, and it was a decision made by a, a body that was elected by the president that mostly consists of people who are in the real estate um, and redevelopment industries. Um, and we were interested in that outcry about the relocation, um, partly because the archive is a public good, but one that itself has problematic limitations in terms of what it can hold and what it represents and whose voices are in the archive itself. So um, our project is a mixed reality work that um, attempts to interrogate and investigate that question of the archive as an already haunted space, a space that is haunted by what is missing from it and then haunted by the ghosts within it. Um, and so that's a, an ongoing project uh, for the next year that Carrie and I will be working on. That well, sounds extremely interesting. Um, the thing that, that keeps coming up for me in thinking about uh, the work that you've been doing, um, because you're so focused on artist books, um, which have a long history, um, but obviously undergo a lot of transformations in the 20th century as well. Um, I wonder how you think about the relationship between the artist book and the category of poetry. Um, in the MIT book, it's hard to discuss the MIT book because it's called the book, so sometimes I'll just call it the MIT book maybe. Uh, in the MIT book, you talk about uh, Mallarmé as this really important um, historical uh, moment at the end of the 19th century where the conception of the book's relationship to poetry changes. Perhaps that could be a jumping off point, but I'm just wondering more, you know, more broadly, how you think about the relationship between the artist book and the book of poetry um, and what sort of boundary problems there are that are mediated by the relationship between poetry and the book? That's a good question. And I, I am, it, it's interesting that you say that they're they're kind of imbricated in that way, particularly through Mallarmé, because it is a major feature of um, 20th century poetry in particular, that uh, it is a form that fundamentally includes multiple movements in which poets are attempting to use and exploit the features of the book form um, in, you know, for one reason or another, whether it's um, the Russian futurists making their own handmade books out of wallpaper and using rubber stamps and kind of whatever materials they can get their hands on because of the kind of um, scrappy, you know, uh, very um, socially motivated dynamic of that group and wanting to share their work as widely as possible. Um, or Italian futurists who are saying, well, let's, let's actually publish our poems in newspapers and as leaflets that get dropped from airplanes. Um, or someone like Mallarmé who um, viewed the possibilities of the book as the possibilities of sort of magnifying what a poem could do by ranging all over the page and really using what um, typographic and visual play could could do to alter a work's meaning. And, and there are touchstones across the 20th century of, of writers who do this, who, who want to work in a visual way that plays with what a book makes possible. Um, it's interesting to track how that shifts over time um, towards the, I think it's, it's sort of a direct through line and many people have seen this, to experiments by poets in electronic literature where um, one sees the possibilities of the um, medium that is available to one. And so uh, then one tries to reconfigure what one does to play with and exploit that medium. Mm -hmm. So someone like Bob Brown creating the Reedies um, in the middle part of the 20th century, I'm sorry, in the, you know, in the modernist period, um, is a like, direct precursor to people who wanted to work in hypertext and other kinds of visually mediated digital poetics. Yeah, I often think about um, how complicated uh, the history of the relationship of poetry to the book is in the 20th century, partly due to the emergence of free verse. Um, so Mallarmé would be a crucial figure there, but the whole, you know, it strikes me that the whole, um, the movement to free verse in which uh, the poem is not necessarily bound by a pre-established form in terms of the line break 
it also goes well beyond the question of where the lines are broken and sort of opens up the possibility of finding other formal models for what a poem can be. Um, so at the Center for Expanded Poetics um, that I direct in Montreal, I mean, we're interested in, in how other formal models from the sciences or from the other arts, you know, enter into ways of thinking about the poem. And sometimes I think about, you know, that entire question is bound up with the history of free verse because that's what makes the form of the poem contingent. Um, so it goes beyond where one breaks a line and becomes the whole question of, of what poetry is in the first place. And I think a lot of poets in a contemporary moment, and you're certainly one of them, are working with, let's say, the question of the book as a poetic form in its own right. So that on the one hand, we can think about the sonnet, or we can think about the elegy, or we can think about iambic pentameter um, in terms of measure, but we could also think about the book as a formal unit. Um, and so I wonder, um, yeah, how, how you think about the, the relationship of the book to the history of, um, of uh, free verse, open field poetry, these kinds of formal developments. I like the way you put that, and that makes a lot of sense to me that um, uh, in a way um, that, that movement is tied to an understanding that this is the distribution method for um, our works, and as those distribution methods expand, um, as, as they have uh, across the 20th and 21st centuries, um, there's a di desire to explore and, and exploit those potentialities in the same way that uh, poets find out what a sonnet is and say, how do, I, how do I make the sonnet say the things that I want it to say? How do I redo Shakespeare in a way that is expressive of my own historic moment? Um, so there is a, a nice mapping of the, of the formal relationships there. And I know that at the Center for Expanded Poetics, you are in the process of publishing works of contemporary poetry in book form um, in the, the document series and in your Resograph um, publications. Is this something that is a direct part of that project? Um, well, certainly there, I mean, uh, there we're looking at publishing works of poetry, but also works of critical theory, also artist books that would be on the boundary between what we think of as art and, and poetry. And obviously those categories um, are malleable, as you say, on the basis of, let's say, where a project takes someone while they're in the midst of doing that. I love that formulation from the beginning of your talk that um, uh, the work teaches you, you know, what you need to do formally in the process of, of producing it. And I think that we're trying to um, think about the process of making a book in that way at the CEP. Um, maybe I can pull up on screen share um, just a, a photograph, some images of our risograph printing projects. Can you see that, Emma? Yeah, looks great. Yeah, so the risograph um, is the center of, uh, of our well, in a way, the center of the whole CEP, it's come to be uh, the thing that people seem to gravitate toward the most. And the risograph is almost like a digital screen printing process where um, uh, you put in an image or a text and it burns um, 600 dots per inch into uh, a template and then it pushes the ink up through that. Uh, so it's a dot printing process, which is, which is proximate to screen printing. And you can see that it produces um, some people working on it. Uh, you know, these lovely rich colors, um, and there's also a lot of contingency uh, in the process of printing, and you, got a, you get a lot of registration errors and things like that that produce a lot of unexpected effects. Um, so we're using the Rizzo as the center of our bookmaking process. You can see here, uh, we're also doing some collage projects and workshops with the Rizzo um, that get a lot of people involved. But I can pull up the, um, uh, the documents page real quick um, and see some of these books that we're producing. So here's a couple of them, Dead Time uh, by Devin Wanger and Looking for Livingston, which is uh, M. Norbezi Phillips' first book that, um, that she gave us permission to reissue. Um, and you can see how they look on the page here using the, the risograph or using a blue ink. And what's interesting about this process is that um, we've tried to make it really collaborative. Um, so one of the 
uh, coordinators at the CEP, Jessica Babinak uh, is the person who prints the book and has become a real pro in the Rizograph. Um, and then we have uh, a designer who's working on the book. Um, and then we have Antiism uh, publishing and uh, binding and distributing the book as well. Um, so it gets the researchers at the CEP um, involved in the whole process of moving between design and printing, authorship and editing, and then finally um, the binding and distribution of the book and antiism. And what's been interesting about that project for me is that um, the collaboration with antiism started uh, around the document series, um, but then it's also blossomed into a couple of exhibitions, um, making an artist book with an artist, Bretta Walker, which is a book of, of poetry and photography that then became an exhibition. Um, an exhibition of, of sculptural work mostly by Alexei Kukulievich from Vienna, uh, and now projects like this. So I think, I think what fascinates me about that project, you know, I didn't know how it was going to go, and that it's resulted in a whole range of different engagements and collaborations working together, including this conversation that we're having right now. So the book, in that sense, becomes a kind of nodal point for all these other elements of the ways that people are thinking, the practices that they're engaged in. And I think a device like the Rizograph can operate in the same way because it's something that's sort of cool that people like to use. You know, they get involved in thinking about print in a way that they might not, you know, if we were just sending these books off to a, to a printer. Yeah, that really points to the sociality of books and the fact that and, uh, that a book is a kind of social object. It's one of the complaints that um, some readers of of the codex book have about digital readers is that they feel like some of that um, social connection is lacking that you, you can't just hand off your copy of a book to another person um, that 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 kind of shared reading experience looks much different in the digital realm than it does uh, in, with physical books but of course it, it is possible um, to to have a shared collaborative reading and book making experience in the digital realm. But we just have to wrap our heads around the ways in which uh, it can and fundamentally should be a different experience, uh, given the different things that the computer and the networked uh, capacities of computers can do. Um, so that I mean, we could collaborate on a, on a book with you in Montreal and me here in Seattle, and it would be a different kind of experience than it would have uh, earlier in, say, the 20th century, when we might have done it through male art, like Ulysses Carrion and his uh, friends, you know, from between Amsterdam and, and Mexico. Um, so those, um, there, it, it will be a fundamentally different kind of book and a different experience, but this, the social aspect of our relationship to the book is, is present in both kinds of book forms. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about this project that you're doing on the body. Um, as including not only, you know, there's so much emphasis on the physical tactility of the book um, in its traditional form, um, which as you point out, you know, it's great to read your study and see how mutable that physical form has been over the centuries. Um, so it's not like it's just changed once the book becomes a digital form as well. But um, there's so much emphasis on the, the tactility of the book, the relay, let's say, between the bent arm and, um, and the eye uh, that one of the people you interviewed mentions. But then if we include the process of production, let's say poiesis in that sense. So thinking about poetry as poiesis or making or production is not only the question of the poem as a form, but also the making up of the medium um, that will include the poem as a final form. Then you bring into focus the whole collaborative process of its production and all the, the sort of collectivity of bodies and skills that are involved in that, you know, so I was talking to Maya the other day and she, she mentioned that she was actually the one who had bound this artist book by Bretta Walker, right? So that capacity of the hands, you know, to do things that I don't know how to do in the process of binding and producing a book. It's such a fascinating way of thinking about the relay, let's say, between skills and production and ideas that go into this. The book is something which is at once ideal and material. Um, so you get a whole collective of bodies working on the production of the book, as well as the physical experience of its, of its reading. Yeah, it, you know, it used to be such a specialized activity, um, book, book making and book binding, um, and the um, separation of the act of writing from the act of binding 
is present in the very earliest days of the book. And it's something that really persisted, um, you know, through, uh, through the ability to mass produce books, which occurs, you know, sometime uh, around the Victorian period where mass production becomes so, um, so possible and so widespread that you end up quality product because it becomes so easy um, to, to manufacture. The, um, that, that interest in uh, using the modes of production, you know, persists into the 21st century as we get access to not only devices like the Risograph, um, but print on demand books and the ways in which digital technologies have changed the very uh, publishing system on which all of the books that we buy today depend facilitating uh, book production in a way that that makes certain kinds of experimentation actually less expensive than they once were and and um, in some ways reduces some of that that historical dichotomy that artists and and poets in the 20th century really wanted to intervene and wanted to say you know like carry on the poet should be able to design the book and make the book and play with the materials and there's no need to kind of separate out those two roles. I think that we're, that we see that today um, in, you know, poets conceptualizing works to be distributed as PDFs um, and how do we play with and exploit um, PDF format um, or uh, poets uh, and, and writers uh, deliberate deliberately um, inventing books that are um, generative novels written uh, to be, you know, written as code that could generate any number of potential uh, solutions that then get published uh, as a book of, that includes the code so that the, the code is kind of part of the part of the work and that it's, it's all conceived as a whole. And in fact, the output is less significant than, than the code that was generated um, to produce it like the ones that are that are published under the Using Electricity series that Nick Monfort edits for Counterpath Press. Um, so that there is a, an, a trajectory there that has to do, and others have studied this far more than I have, with um, poets' interest in and uh, understanding of the technologies and desire to break down that boundary between writer and producer. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I, it looks like we're sort of up against um, 4.30. I wonder if uh, I want to open it up one more time to the possibility that, that anybody listening might have uh, a question for, for Amaranth. Um, if anybody wants to jump in, we have a little more time. And if not, ah, here we go. Um, I, can, I can read this. Uh, so from Suzanne Roder, uh, just musing about how the new formats and experiences in the book could make poetry more accessible to audiences of varying abilities who perhaps felt left out previously. As we might, as we move beyond the codex, braille and audiobooks, it might be interesting to collaborate with previously unheard voices. Yeah, great answer. Emma, if you want to speak to that. I, I think that's a wonderful observation. Um, and, and I absolutely agree. I think there's a kind of um, democratizing uh, quality uh, to uh, to this particular moment in books and, and in, in the interest in book form. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a resurgence of the chapbook, um, which maybe is ongoing for the, the past 20 years, but uh, it's one of, you know, our earliest printed book forms that was meant to create these kind of tiny pamphlets that were um, accessible uh, to, to lay readers who didn't necessarily have the capacity to purchase a whole book, but you could purchase one of those little pamphlets. Um, and chapbooks in the poetry world are, are now kind of like a, a, an important um, you know, foundation for, for many writers, both those who haven't yet published a full length book and those who have um, as a means of, of reaching different audiences, niche audiences, audiences that you only meet in performance settings, audiences who can access your work online who can purchase it you know from around the world um, shipping someone a tiny pamphlet is is a lot cheaper than shipping them a whole book um, but that's just one example of many which i'm sure um, you have others suzanne that have come to you um, but i think that that you're that you're right that this is an interesting moment for that just 
give it one second here to see if anybody else wants to jump in. Okay. Um, oh, here's Harley. Harley Smart. Uh, there were some marginalia notes about the bookman, and you noted that your father had patented this. This is true. Um, when I was a kid, my father, um, seeing how uh, essential the Walkman and then the Discman were um, in our lives, particularly having you know two two young people in his home, um, he is someone who always is thinking about technology and and technological change. I I was definitely born in a family that were both readers and early technology adopters. Um, yeah, he took out a patent on the word Bookman. Um, thinking that that would be the next thing in the iteration of Walkman, Discman, Bookman, that we would have these portable book readers. Um, the company Franklin Electronics that that bought the patent didn't actually end up manufacturing something that was like what we have as contemporary e-readers. Um, they produced these very small, almost pocket calculator style uh, books or really, you know, readers that you would put a chip into the back and you would have like a, a three line digital screen that could show you three lines of the Bible or a dictionary definition. Um, so they were, they were useful for reference works and they were super rudimentary, but I was, I was fascinated by that as a kid. And when I was writing the book, I realized that subconsciously that must have had an influence on my own interest in uh, e-readers and, and the relationship between print and digital media. Oh, that's really cool. That's a great story. Um, any last questions? Thanks everyone for your time. I really appreciate it and I'm, I'm honored both to have the work shown at Antiism and to be included in volume among this really awesome range of programs. Yeah, I also just want to say thank you to volume and, and to Maya for organizing this and, and thanks Amrit for a great conversation. It's great to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. <laughs> Thank you too for your time and yeah, just being keen to participating to this. It was a uh, yeah, really biggest yeah honor for me. And after reading the MIT book of yeah, having you jump on the project and the exhibition here, super happy about it all. <laughs> Likewise, great. But thank you, messages. But I think that's it for questions. Oh, thanks, Maya. Perfect. Let you go back to your day, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Okay. Right. Take care, everyone. Stay healthy. Right, yeah. Take, take care.